Hello everyone, Ruby Ravel at the ready, here to serenade you with songs of sirens and saintly sorrows as we reprise our survey of Mars in Square with Neptune. Now I want you to imagine that you are a powerful and valiant hunter who is used to having success in the world. Whenever you go out into the field, you always come back with the most kills. Whenever you attempt to make any conquests of the fairer sex, you find you are always welcomed by their desires. But even though you have been accustomed to besting people on the battlefield and as a warrior scholar, proving the superior might of your intellect over the inferior minds of others, you have long been loath to admit that within you lurks a secret terror of the ocean of the coastal realms and all of the mysterious occurrences that happen therein. So for the majority of your life, you have kept your activities cloistered to the realms of earth. And yet the coast possesses a kind of taboo fascination for you, this realm of the unknown. It possesses this otherworldly mystique that from time to time gets under your skin and haunts you in your dreams. And one day, in a bit of a Neptunian fog, you allow yourself to wend that way when you hear the beautiful singing of a siren song. It is miraculous. Is it, it is expressive of delights that you always secretly dreamed of but never thought were truly humanly possible. So even though you have gone out without your armor, but are still equipped with a sword, you allow yourself to overcome these sneaking fears and tiptoe onto the beach to find out the source of this miraculous singing. And as you approach the shore, you are astonished to see a beautiful blue-skinned maiden standing on the cusp of the lapping waters, her very skin the colour of lapis lazuli melted into a delightfully fleshy form. She casts a glamour over you that enchants you and lures you towards her. And even though you tend to think of yourself as being something of a Casanova, whose sexual virility is without doubt and who can pleasure any companion who, with whom he shares his bed, you begin to feel some trepidation. You start to realise that what started out as you, as the pursuer, now leaves you feeling like the pursued more like prey or a victim than a powerful warrior. And yet you are in the thrall of this enigmatic blue-skinned woman. You have to approach her. There is more pain than pleasure in this tentative approach. She is so beautiful that it actually hurts your heart and brings up mysterious wounds that are echoes from long ago which you can't quite pin down. Before you know it, with time seeming to stand still and yet also moving in quantum leaps and bounds, you find yourself right there on the shore so that her eyes are capable of gazing straight into yours. And through the deep azure blue of her iris, whole universes seem to unfold, to cascade within you, awakening memories that are beautiful and yet which make your mortal life look so petty it would almost have been better to keep them dormant. You see her before you, and rather than just thinking of some cheap one-night stand or conquest, you feel as though you would lay down your life for this woman, that you would give her every last thing you have ever loved and possessed if she would only grace you with but a single kiss or passing word of kindness. And you reach out to touch her, even if just gently to brush her skin or to brush your lips against hers. And yet as you reach out, it's almost as though whatever solidity she had turns to water and she retreats, but caught in her thrall, in the tractor beam of her spirit, you keep drawing forward and forward until before you know it, you are waist high in the water the tide is coming in and you realise that if you don't stop now and deta detach yourself from this spell, disenchant yourself, 
that you are running the risk of drowning as you have never learned to swim in these waters having secured yourself upon the land for such a long time. And with fight and flight taking hold, you sensibly choose flight and retreat back to the land. And this happenstance initiates a profound conundrum in our valiant hunter as it was for him nothing less than a life-changing experience that has turned the rules of reality upon its very head. He feels that he must flee now, stay away from that blue-skinned maiden as much as possible, even though he continues to hear her singing, enchanting him, beguiling him, calling him back to the ocean, where it seems to promise infinite pleasures, but which he feels in his heart and knows that will be forever withholden from him. He runs further and further inland, and the further he runs away, the stronger that song seems to get. Never before in his entire life has the hunter run from something that he wanted. And yet, he feels that to give in to this desire, to give in to this want for this mysterious blue-skinned maiden, would be a destruction for him, would be a death, would be the dissolution of every kind of firm hold or grasp that he has ever possessed upon the world in which he has achieved his power and his accomplishments. And yet, in running away from the maiden, he can barely keep back the tears that beat down his ashen cheeks, because he knows that this maiden will haunt his soul forever, that there will be a part of his spirit that will forever feel starved and undernourished and underfilled unless it was able to drink from the cup that she seemed to promise and yet he knows in his heart of hearts will always mysteriously withhold. Now I was driven to explore this aspect more deeply as I had an epiphany this morning where I realized that there is a trend that has been dogging my romantic existence ever since Mars first started squaring Neptune back during retrograde season around autumn last year. Having found myself emerging from a relationship that was one of the happiest that I ever possessed, but which sadly was brought to an end, I have been caught in a double bind. Part of me has felt that I have had to move forward, even though I don't want, really want to, because there is a feeling in my heart that anyone I encounter will always be second best in some way compared to the person that I've lost. And yet, whenever I have met anyone since then who has aroused feelings of deep attraction, both sexually and romantically, within me, I found myself responding with great terror there's been a sense that even though these people arouse these deep feelings in me, there is an aura of unavailability and intangibility to them. That the more I try and pursue them, the more I will only be incurring my own pain and sense of romantic woundedness. And yet I have also found myself on the other end of that square, playing the Neptunian siren, that I have been aware that there are people who are perhaps deeply attracted to me and yet who I am completely unavailable and withdrawn from. But without getting too drawn into my own personal amorous dilemmas, I thought this was very expressive of how the job of Mars in astrology is usually to drive us to go after what we want. And yet, when Mars is caught in the thrall of Neptune, often we can feel so bewildered, so beguiled, so enchanted and then disenchanted, so poisoned by the sour cup of fate, that we find ourselves actually running or withdrawing from things that we want because we are terrified of having to face our own vulnerability or the possibility of rejection that we withdraw from things that we would ordinarily pursue because we're worried about the possibility of those oceans within being opened up against our will. It feels like 
an emotional violation where you find yourself, yourself in those situations where you are attracted to someone you don't want to be attracted to because you know that nothing will end well in that arena. And yet it is very hard to resist that call at the same time because it seems to be hinting towards deeper realities. And this is not a new epiphany by any stretch. If we look at the writings of mystics in almost all religious traditions, we find that many of them saw sorrow as being the seeds of enlightenment, that because deep disappointments in love and tragic losses can so overwhelm us, they break up all the boundaries and saturnine structures that we erect around our hearts to make us feel protected and guarded and safe in this world. But some emotional experiences are so intense that no matter how grounded we are, we can still find ourselves completely overcome. It is like a big flood that comes out of nowhere for which no amount of preparation could have truly protected us. We have nothing to do except just to submit to those waters and find a way of swimming in those swirling eddies of emotional confusion. And yet in engaging with this emotional, spiritual deluge, we can also find parts of us opened up and stimulated that we would normally deny. Our sorrow can also be a gateway to compassion because it makes us more empathic and understanding of the wounds of other people because they resonate with the wounds that have awoken within us. So you might find that some people with Mars in aspect to Neptune natally, or perhaps who have Mars in Pisces or in aspect to a Piscean placement, may find themselves strangely compelled to experiences that involve some kind of self-immolation or dissolution. And in this, I'm particularly inspired by the stories of the saints from the Golden Legend, where they are a very strange lot in that they continually reject all worldly offers of pleasure and success in favour of sacrificing themselves entirely to their faith. And in pursuit of this, they often deliberately choose martyrdom. They actively engage in situations that involve damage to themselves. They invite torture. They invite um, horrible tyrants to kill them. They ask God to make them sick in the hopes that they will become more Christ-like by sacrificing their attachment to themselves and their egoistic desires. Likewise, in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a practice which involves the initiate deliberately going to a charnel ground where corpses are piled and where ghosts and hungry demons are believed to creep and engaging in meditation rather than trying to protect yourself from these odious otherworldly entities you actively invite them to feast upon yourselves you actively invite them to rend you apart and to nourish themselves on your skeleton and flesh you make of yourself a sacrifice. You deliberately renounce your bastion of power in this world so that you can gain a greater understanding of the other world. Anyway, I'm going to leave that there for now. If any of you have any aspects of your life that you would like to gain a greater understanding of, feel free to email me on the link below if you fancy some spiritual counselling or some astrological guidance of some kind. If you would like to support this channel to aid in its growth and prosperity, uh, the link to my Patreon is below. It's The pledge at the moment is very cheap, only $5 a month, so relatively affordable for most of you. And uh, yeah, thank you for all your love and support, and I hope you will enjoy this video and derive something from it.